I'll be reading from Luke 23, verses 39 through 49. One of the criminals who were hanging railed him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save, save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour and three was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I have... And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts, and all, had, and all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him in, from Galilee stood at the distance watching these things. All right, good morning. Good morning. We'll get through about half of that good text today. Uh, thank you, Wyatt, for reading. Uh, proud of our teens. Uh, we've been having studies on Wednesday nights downstairs for some time, and uh, Seth, Seth's prayer was real. You know, we're not always polished here at Old Union, but we're real, and I like that. Um, but we've been having studies downstairs with our teens now for several months, and they've kind of grown uh, in some ways more than others. But I'm proud of those boys. Um, uh, thankful for them and uh, our girls too, don't get me wrong, just so proud of that group and uh, made me smile seeing Wyatt up here reading this morning. So we're in Luke 23 and that's where we'll be today. Uh, you can go ahead and open up to that and uh, let me say a few things about our study before we get going and then we'll dive into that and get through about half of that reading. Um, uh, yeah, OU Kids is great. Seth mentioned how good it is to see the kids up here. Something that you may not know is that sometimes on Wednesday nights, they'll, they'll come up here and they'll lead OU Kids themselves. And so we'll come in here and we'll catch them, you know, leading through OU Kids. And occasionally they leave us presents. And uh, this morning, Seth and I both have laughed because there's a googly eye on the pulpit this morning. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, just uh, thankful for our kids around here. And uh, the neat things that, that, that we get to do for them and with them. It's just really good. And so I'm glad every one of you are here. Glad every single one of you are here. We do have several that are out. Uh, vacations are hitting this week. And so we have a good number of folks that are usually here that aren't this morning. We'll have a few more in the weeks upcoming, as Nick mentioned. But I'm thankful for everyone that are here. We try to be more than just a Sunday church at Old Union, though. And I hope you know that. We try to be more than just a Sunday church. And a lot of good things have been going on recently, like last night. You've heard about the Family Fun Day from Nick. That was a great night. Uh, the teens this Wednesday will be going on a service project with Heather and some others. And so that's really good uh, that we've got that going on. Uh, I'd like to make sure you know about the studies that we have throughout the week. Uh, we'll meet tonight for a great study. We'll meet Wednesday night for another one. I know of other studies that go on throughout the week with a lot of you guys. And so if you want to get involved with something like that, maybe a little smaller than uh, even 10 or so or around 50 in size or whatever, just holler at one of us and we'll point you in the right direction. I've not made mention of this. Uh, really cool to hear about the Ladies' Day upcoming potentially in November. But hey, mark your calendars. Write this in the bulletin if you'd like. December the 2nd through the 4th, we have Whispering Pines reserved for a winter retreat. Okay, that's December 2nd through the 4th. A little later than we'd like it to be, but we're going to try something uh, this year, and that's the date that we could get. And so December 2nd, that's a Friday, through the 4th, that's a Sunday. Uh, we have the retreat facility reserved at Whispering Pines, and that's for everybody, families, everybody. Um, we'll try to have a really great God-glorifying weekend uh, that weekend, December 2nd through the 4th. Okay? And so we're more than just a Sunday church, but we want Sundays to be good too. We try to, we try to make our Sundays very good around here. I'm reminded of an old marquee sign. Some of you may have seen this before. Uh, I've not seen this in a while, but I remember an old marquee sign that said, uh, we're not the Dairy Queen, but we have good Sundays. You remember that? And uh, I was thinking about that this week. I was also thinking about how that, that, 
It kind of sounds like an Amelia joke, to be honest with you. Um, but we try to have good Sundays here. What makes a good Sunday? What makes a good Sunday? A lot of folks would say it's how the worship is led. Seth did a good job this morning. I'm glad that he's wanting to uh, lead singing and, uh, and to lead some songs that are, that are good ones. Uh, they're all good ones, but lead some, even some that may be newer for us. I think that's really good. A lot of people say good Sundays are made according to how the worship is conducted. A lot of people say that good Sundays are made on account of the preaching. And uh, both of those things are really important. But uh, I would suggest to you that something that makes a really good Sunday, or maybe the thing that makes a really good Sunday gathering, is the heart of you guys, the heart of the people. And when you assemble with people whose hearts are transformed, whose hearts have been changed by Jesus, that's a good gathering. It's a really good gathering. And I think you can feel it. Um, I know that, that, that we're funny about feelings sometimes, but I think you can just... It just feels different when you're around somebody who is in love with Jesus. And, that, and that's what makes a good gathering. I want us to be people who are in love with Jesus. I want to be people who know that he is our Savior, that our life has been changed. Redeemed is a Bible word, but it's a good word. Our life has been changed and redeemed from sin through Jesus. And so we're in love with this guy. And we enjoy gathering and, and, and sharing fellowship with people who are also in love with Jesus. Okay? I think that's what makes a good gathering, when we know that God's Spirit is present. Uh, I want us to talk about what it means to love Jesus for just a minute. And I've said this a few times, and I want to keep saying it over and over again. Uh, maybe this is just me, but sometimes you just don't feel like you love somebody. Or maybe you worry that you don't love somebody that you're supposed to. And so for me, I like to think about how Jesus is lovable. Let that ring in your heads for just a minute. You may struggle to love him. Maybe sometimes you think, I don't love him, or I don't love him like I should, or I just don't have the feels for Jesus, you know? But let me suggest to you that he is lovable. You know what I mean by that? He is able to be loved. He, 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 is, he, he has much to love. Can I put it that way? I remember when, uh, when Kelly and I were, uh, before we were a dating couple, and I'm thankful for how, one summer especially, our life kind of worked together. She was done with college. I was in college. We'll leave that there. Um, <laughs> but our lives worked together to where we got to spend almost the whole summer together. And so she got to know me, and I got to know her, and I discovered that there are things about her that I loved. Does that make sense? Like you discover someone is lovable. And obviously, she discovered that I was pretty lovable too, right? And so... Just teasing. She, she, was, she was indeed lovable, is indeed lovable, is how I should say that. Now, I don't know if Jesus would want me to say this. I don't know if he would like me saying this or not. But I think that he is more lovable than me. I think that he has more, more characteristics and qualities and goodness about him that make him more lovable than me. And I won't say that about any of you guys, but I kind of think it might be true for y'all as well. Jesus is lovable. He is supremely lovable. And when we spend time getting to know him and study him, it's been the whole point of the studies this year, is just emphasize the nature and the character of Jesus. We've tried to do that. And when you spend time with him, I suggest that you see that he is lovable. And at the moment, I'm hard-pressed to find a place where I see him as more lovable, able to be loved, than in where we are in Scripture right now. We talked about this a few weeks ago, and I, and I, and I pray that this phrase is, is enormous for you. We discussed how Jesus is being tortured. He's being fixed on a cross to be crucified. And, and, it, and it seems that he is directly extending forgiveness to the very people who are killing him. And, 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 I, and I tried to present to us that, that while I think that he is directly pleading forgiveness for even these, this is also a general statement for all of us who are, who are sinful and resistant and obstinate and unkind and, 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 and who are refusing to follow God. He wants us to be forgiven. He wants forgiveness extended to us all. This is the nature of our Jesus. Is that not lovable, church? Amen? Amen. This is lovable. And so I ask us to, stint, to, 
to, to I, I have, I've tried to really just camp out on just, just tiny sections of Scripture in an effort for us to discover Him as supremely lovable. This is our Jesus. Um, I've been blessed um, in, 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 a, in a relatively short span of ministry. This is my 13th year of professional ministry. In 2009, I became a youth minister, and I've been in some type of ministry ever since. And so in that short amount of time, I've been blessed to be able to help other ministers, um, younger ministers typically. Um, this week, this is really neat. This is the only reason I'm bringing this up. So this week, I got a re- a request from, from a, another minister who's starting in ministry. He's a student at Heritage, but he's already in his 30s. And so he's getting a little late start. That's great, though. That's great. And by the way, I've never, I don't know if I've ever said this. If any of you are interested in studying the Bible and maybe even pursuing ministry, I like to, to praise where I graduated uh, from, Heritage Christian University. And in fact, there's a benefit dinner coming up. I really didn't, I'm not doing this for any... There's a dinner coming up. You don't have to give a dollar to them. But if you want to come to that dinner with me and hear about this school that will let you take classes, and it's, it's really, really great. But anyway, so the gentleman calls me this week, and he says, Stephen, I need to interview a minister who's been doing this for 10 years plus for congregations that are 150 plus in size. I said, well, great. How can I help you? And he asks me this series of questions. And one of the questions, I'm getting to the point, one of the questions he asks me, he says, Stephen, what do you think is the most important thing for your congregation? What's the most important thing? Now, what would you say? What would you, I'd like to hear you guys tell me sometime what, what you would suggest is the most important thing for us as a people. Well, this is, this is the preacher words that came out of my mouth. Okay, I said, I think the most important thing for us as a congregation is conformity to Christ. Doesn't that sound so preacher-like? All that means is to pursue Christ likeness to try to follow Jesus to be like him that's why we put his name on our sign right church we are the people of Jesus and so we can get distracted by all kinds of other things that aren't bad necessarily but I really think that our aim our goal is to pursue Christ likeness the the preacher word is conformity to Jesus, conformity to Christ. And so when I, when, I, when I put all that together for you, this is what we're talking about this morning. Man, this guy is lovable. And man, is it not good for us to be like him. For us to try to be like our King, our Savior, our Redeemer, Jesus. And if we're going to do that, okay, this is the point I'm making as we get into the text. If we're going to do that, then forgiveness must be a part of our life. It must be. Not only receiving it as one who knows that he is wretched and sinful, like we've sang, excellent selection, selections, but we also must be a people who extend forgiveness, people who are forgiving. Again, let these words linger in your heart. Uh, I've not done this as much as I'd like. I think this is the next slide, but I'd like for, I'd, I'd like for us to emphasize more here Jesus' model prayer. I had to memorize that growing up. I, we, we said it before every single football game. And I had already memorized it, I think, in third, third grade class, Bible class. But anyway, so we would say the Lord's model prayer uh, before football games. And it didn't, it didn't really mean a whole lot to me then, but, but even then, the words were rooting in my heart. And so now it means a lot to me. And I want it to mean a lot to you. Can some of you say it? Do you know this? You can say it with me if you'd like. The Lord is my shepherd. No, that's the 23rd Psalm. I'll get it in a minute. Um, Our, Father. Our Father. Thank you, Bill. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Say it like you mean it. P- pay attention to these words. Maybe you are, and that's great. I don't mean to judge you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who trespass or who debt against us, right? we got different translations going on here. That's great. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. What a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that. But then in Matthew's account, this is directly what follows that prayer. Have you ever noticed this? And so he makes many emphasis, 
emphasis in that prayer. But then he follows it with this. This is intriguing to me. Go back if you don't mind. Back one. He followed it with, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That's big, isn't it, church? Yeah, that's really big, okay? And so, and so I, I often say things like this, and, 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 and maybe it's just you know, the flavor of the week, so to speak. Maybe this is just the topic that I'm in right now, but, it, but, but I don't think that's right. I don't think forgiveness is just a topic for us to consider as a characteristic of, of a Jesus follower. Forgiveness is big. Our God in heaven, through His Son, is forgiving our transgressions. He's, he's removing them as far as the east is from the west, to use to borrow from old language. This is profound, and it's amazing, and it's wonderful. And oh, to be His people who forgive like this. Yeah, this is a big one. This is a big one. Maybe even the, uh, I think I said a few weeks ago, we can't deny Luke is emphasizing the importance of forgiveness in the story of the cross. Can I say that one more time? You can't deny it. You study Luke, you can't deny that Luke is emphasizing forgiveness as a major theme of the cross. That's what he's doing. Okay? And so just some th- a few things that I wanted to tell you. The next slide is uh, just a statement that I've come up with. It's mine. You can challenge it and change it if you'd like. But, but, but I think about how I put all this together. Jesus is not a Savior unless He forgives us. That's what makes Him our Savior. It's that he forgives us. Again, he's not a savior if he doesn't forgive us. He forgives us, therefore he is our savior. And then how can we be saved unless we are like him in forgiving others? I think that's the message of the text. I know that's really wordy, but I think that's what's going on here. And so again, if we follow Jesus, if we're the church of Christ, if we follow Jesus, forgiveness must characterize our lives. The receiving of it from Jesus to ourselves, from Him, and the extension of it to others, or to all, I should say. This must characterize our life, okay? One of you came up to me after the lesson two weeks ago. I really like when you do this. I really like when you do this, okay? One of you said, Stephen, Jesus was forgiving those who had yet to repent. Someone said that to me. Stephen, Jesus is forgiving those who had yet to repent. I want you to wrestle with that, and I want you to think about that. And I want you to be amazed by that as I have been. You see, I think we often connect forgiveness to a response that we make. And that's appropriate. You hear me say that? It's appropriate. We need to connect forgiveness to a response that we make to the grace of God. I think that's why the Bible indicates we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, for instance, Acts chapter 2. I also think in Acts chapter 4, don't deny this, the same apostles preach repentance and connect it to the forgiveness of sins. You see, it's important for us to respond in faith to God and and, and take part in this forgiveness, this act of forgiveness that God extends. But maybe, just maybe, we would be really, really blessed to consider what Jesus is doing in this story and to consider how forgiveness is extended by Jesus to all. He's throwing it out there. He's saying, here it is. I want you to be forgiven I want you to know the grace of God. No matter who you are, what you've done, what you said, how bad you've treated whoever, or how bad they've treated you, I want you to throw it out there. This is what Jesus is doing. We might be really good to think of it that way. And this is where this statement comes from. Jesus' forgiveness is extended. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're unrepentant. Yet, it is only received by those who humble themselves and submit to Him as Savior and Redeemer. And that's the invitation for you all. To submit. To surrender. To receive it. That person you're thinking about across the aisle, or who's left here, or who's angry with you, or who... Submit. Surrender. Receive. Forgiveness. Extend forgiveness. It's a beautiful story. Okay, I say all of that because I think we see that now pictured in this story of the cross. You want to see it with me? 
You want to see two people with two different attitudes in the story of the cross? See what you think. Look, look with me now back in Luke 22. 23, rather. Luke 23. Okay, I'll suggest that we see um, what I'm saying here in, in, in the statements of these two criminals who are dying with Jesus at Calvary. Luke 23, 39, the first criminal on the cross. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Think about that with me. Hurling abuse, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Hurling abuse is an interesting way to translate that. That's New American Standard for you. That's the one I always read from, or tend to read from. Some of your translations probably say rebuking. One of the criminals was rebuking Jesus. Maybe scoffing Jesus. Okay? The original word in Greek there is blasphemio. And so if you have a New King James, I think I got this right. If you have a New King James, your translation says one of the criminals was blaspheming Jesus. Sounds like a big deal. That's a religious word. We we typically only use that word when when, when we're in a religious context. Okay? And so that means we need to explain it a little bit, I think. What does that mean? This is not perfect, but this is the best I could come up with this week while I was thinking. And so when you blaspheme something, you speak falsely against it. Okay, you, 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 you speak falsely against something that is sacred or that is true. That's blasphemy. Again, one more time. Blasphemy is speaking falsely. It's like slander or, or defamation. You're speaking falsely against something that is good and sacred and true. If, if Clara, I've talked about Amelia, I've I got to mention Clara too. I get in trouble for doing that. Look here. If Clara were to say to me in, in, in her six-year-old Clara cute language, if she were to say, Daddy, I hate you and you're not my daddy, I probably wouldn't look at her and say, how dare you blaspheme your daddy. You, you, you know it? But now if Clara grew up and in her maturity, she rejected the father-daughter relationship, I, you are not my daddy. I hate you. Nothing to do with you. Relationship broken. Now we're getting to this. Now we're, get, we're, we're, we're relating to blasphemy here. Okay? The Bible speaks of blasphemy in such a way. It's terribly grievous. It is, it is a human who is separating themselves from God, refusing that covenant connection. Done with it. Broken. Okay? And that is why Jesus taught that there is no forgiveness for the one who blasphemes the Spirit of God. That's that's how Jesus would teach that. How could there be? Such as separating themselves from the source of forgiveness. Such as wrongly credited their life to something other than the source of life. Are you seeing this? Such as unplugged himself from the power of life. My dad was installing some electricity uh, electricity outlets this week while I was putting this lesson together, and that, that connection made sense at the time. Look, if I, if, I am, if I am pulling myself away from where the power comes from, then how can I receive the benefit of that power? Then that makes sense. Okay? And so, and so we get confused rightfully about this language of blasphemy and it being unforgivable. This is a doctrine that sometimes is hard to teach, but I don't think it, it really has to be. For instance, this is what Jesus said in Mark's account. I've tried not to jump too much. I really haven't, but this is good stuff. Jesus taught this. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. What a forgiving Savior. You're going to say some really terrible, boneheaded, wrong things. Forgiveness is extended to you for that. Isn't that cool? But then Jesus went on to say this. He said, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. Again, where where could forgiveness be at that point? You are rejecting the power of God to forgive. Again, a little confusing. I'm not acting like it's simple, but, but, but I think it can make sense. Okay, back to the first criminal on the cross here. I'll suggest that what this first criminal described in Luke's account was doing, I'll suggest that what he is doing is a sin that will lead to his eternal separation from God. It's a big deal. He's rejecting Jesus as Savior while he's dying, guys. 
I hope I'm wrong. (laughs) But it seems to me that that's what he's doing. He's viciously and arrogantly accusing Jesus of not being the Christ, of not being God's anointed. And so where will his forgiveness come from? I think that's what we're seeing in this text. And it's tragic. It ought to be tragic. We we, We ought not to read this easily. It ought to be upsetting what this man is doing. And, and, I, and I get a little upset when I realize that I've been kind of like this guy sometimes. Will you hang out there with me? Have you ever made demands of God? Have you ever said, God, you know, if you were really who you say you are, if you were really this good, if you, if you, if you really loved me, you would do this. You, you would fix this. You would do it this way. Do you see what this man is doing? Um, th- this is good, and I hope this makes sense. Um, the girls and I are reading the third book of the Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> uh, I recommend these books. They have blessed me. C.S. Lewis was a believer. I quote him a lot from this pulpit. Um, these are children's books, but they're riddled with just beautiful God stories. The third book is called The Horse and His Boy. And I've been reading it, and to be honest with you, I've been a little bored with this one. I don't even know if they've made a movie about this one, have they? Maybe that's why. Um, but we're somewhere around chapter 10 or so, and you see the story is about this lion that's chasing this, this little boy named Shasta. And Shasta and, 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 and his horse, or the horse and his boy, the horse is named Bree, they're running from this lion. This is what the, really the whole book's about, trying to get to a safe place. And, and, and all of a sudden, Shasta and the horse are separated, and the lion shows up, and Shasta's terrified. And he starts talking about how his life has just always been terrible. Always feels like he's got the, you know, the, the raw end of the deal, Shasta. Just not a good life. Well, in that scene, again, somewhere around chapter 10, in that scene, the lion shows up, and Shasta's terrified. But then the lion reveals that he's not been chasing the boy to hurt the boy. But he's been chasing the boy to push him to a place that's far better than he's ever been. I want you to think about that with me. Did I say that well? Some of you looking at me like, what are you talking about? Did I say that well? The lion that the little boy has been so terrified and so upset about and so angry with his entire life is now revealed as the lion that's been pushing him to something way better. It's a really powerful moment in the text. Um, All kinds of scripture comes to my mind when I was reading that. Isaiah 55 was just, 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 just readily in my mind. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. The things that make sense to you, the things that you understand, this is not how God works. You remember this? song we're singing with our kids, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. It's all ties together. God says this through Isaiah, as far as the, as, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than yours, my thoughts than your thoughts. This is beautiful. And so again, I don't mean to take us too far from this story, but I look back at this story and you know what? I've been that first criminal, you know? I've been the one that has thought, this doesn't make sense, this way of yours. I don't understand what you're doing here. Oh, and by the way, if you really are God, if you really are the Christ, wouldn't you be saving yourself and coming down from this cross and saving us with you and taking care of all this nonsense that just doesn't seem to be making any sense at all, obviously? But again, the way of our God one who pushes his precious son to die on a cross even while people blaspheme. And their hearts don't understand. And so they scream and they rebuke. The other accounts reveal that that first criminal was just saying things that the other people were saying all around Jesus. Yet here is God's way. His son dying on a cross for the sins of us all. Seth brought this up. This is really good, brother, and I appreciate you. 
um, I didn't get this till later on in the week, so I didn't emphasize it real strongly this morning, or I, I won't, but how did Jesus respond to that first criminal? You guys see that in the text? I'll tell you how I respond when somebody's dogging me, Nick, you know? I'll tell you how I'm tempted to respond. I'll tell you how I'm tempted to respond when somebody's questioning and calling out my motives, criticizing them. How did Jesus respond? Well, I kind of think he had already responded, hadn't he? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Guys, this is huge. But the second criminal, this is where it all comes together, okay? This is amazing, uh, this man. Uh, the other accounts don't talk about this. That intrigues me. That's coffee conversation. Sit down with me over that one. But anyway, Luke brings up the words of this second criminal. You can go to the next slide here with us. This is what goes on, criminal number two. It says, but the other answered, rebuking him, again, rebuking the first criminal, and said this, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are indeed suffering justly. We are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Okay? I think that this criminal here, it's really neat what he's done. He has diagnosed the heart of the first criminal. A heart that is without the fear of God. That's huge. And that's not like scary movie fear. Don't misunderstand. One of the most common questions I get when talking with people about God is explain to me how we're supposed to fear God. This isn't scary movie tremble afraid. This is a reverence, a trust, a hope that is in God. You see, that second criminal says you don't have a reverence for God. You don't have a, a fear, a trust of the one who is in control of all things. Oh, and by the way, who are you? to be cursing a man who is dying just like you. You see this. What I see in this story is a first criminal who is blind to his own problems, to his own issues, to, him, to, to himself. He's focused on Jesus, a man who has done nothing wrong. And the second criminal points it out. Oh, by the way, who are you, man? You, you are obvious not different. We're all dying. The only difference is that Jesus is dying for something He doesn't deserve. We're up here justly. Again, think about this with me. I like to emphasize here, this is what I always emphasize. This is, this is the copy and paste portion of the lesson in some ways. I've always emphasized how this man would have had to have been to be rebuking and blaspheming and scoffing a dying man. Where does your heart have to be to be doing that? to be yelling and screaming at someone who's dying, to be making demands of someone who's dying. Where does your heart have to be to be doing that? But I'm, I'm going to leave that. I'll emphasize that a little bit, but I'm going to change it from this point forward because I want to focus more on where the heart of this second criminal is. Where does his heart have to be? To be dying on a cross. You get it? to be crucified in pain and torture, just like Jesus. We've emphasized the crucifixion, right? But where does the heart of this second criminal have to be to say, I deserve this? I'm suffering, and I, and I deserve it. You following me? I'm suffering for things that I'm worthy of. I'm suffering because of things that I've done. This man has done nothing wrong. How would you characterize the second criminal? How would you put that into words, his heart? Uh, what state of heart must you have to really believe that crucifixion is what you deserve? That's a, that's a question for us all. Where must his heart be to believe that death as such is what he really deserves? I call that radical humility. Remarkable humility. To be at a place where you believe that you're suffering this way and justly. Um, he has this incredible awareness of his own condition. Of his rebellion, of his separation from God. An awareness that comes from his fear and his reverence of God. God, help me. Let me talk to me for just a minute, you guys, and see if you can relate. God, help me have an awareness of my condition 
of where I am in relationship to where God is. Help me to be aware of that. Help me to be aware of what I deserve as a rebel and as a sinner and one who struggles with terrible thoughts and anger and a desire to lash out and not forgive. God, help me to recognize that in me. This is what we see here of this man. This is uh, why we sing what we've been singing. We sang these words. Just let me remind you of them. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. I'm so thankful for song. It is the best. It really is. Like, like if, you, if you have trouble connecting with God you know, yourself sometime, just try song. Some, somebody had a relationship with God to write that. What should I gain from His reward? <laughs> I have no answer. This I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Man of sorrows. What a name. For the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, helpless we. There's the second man on the cross. Yet spotless Lamb of God is He. Full atonement? Can it be? And then we sang this. We sang this. So again, maybe I'm not in this awareness of my condition or not, but thank you God that, that there's at least song that helps me you know, check into it. I was so lost, I should have died. But you have brought me to your side. You see that in this story? And so I'll say this, and you can chew on this with me. And again, you can reject it, but at least think on this with me. Until I know that Jesus died the death that I deserve. Are you following me? Some of us need keys, like, like, like something. We need to hear something that can help us be closer to our God. Maybe this is it for someone in here today. Until I know that Jesus died the death that I deserve. Until I know that he died the death that I deserve. I cannot be by his side. You want to be by His side. You want, to, you want to be close to the King. You want to live forever with our God. Then we must understand that His Son died the death that we deserve. We must understand this. And, 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 I, and I don't mean, and, and I have a long section in the notes, I'll skip it, okay? You can, I'll skip it. Don't, don't, don't hear that every single time you suffer, it's directly because of some sin that you've committed. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes we suffer for things that are unfair and unjust. This is biblical. But we must understand that we die and suffering exists because of sin. Paul taught, for the wages of sin is death. And then he stopped there, right? No. But... The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> and so, I think that when we acknowledge that, when we acknowledge Jesus, when we respond in faith to this extension of forgiveness, forgiveness is what we receive and salvation is what's granted. Can I say that again? When we acknowledge that Jesus died the death that we deserve, when we are humbled and submissive by that fact, okay, Jesus' forgiveness extended. When we acknowledge this, His forgiveness is then received and salvation is granted. This is what we see in the story. This is what the story's playing out. This is awesome. This second criminal was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise.
How good is that? Amen. Boy, I'd love that. Yeah, that is good, right? I'd love to know exactly what he was thinking when he said that. I've heard some people give their opinion. I'd love to know what he meant when he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What, how did he think about kingdom? Okay. Did he think that Jesus was not going to die? Did he think that he was going to come off that cross? Did he think that Jesus would die and then be ushered into his kingdom? Did he think that Jesus would die and resurrect and then his kingdom would come? I don't know. I wonder how he thought. But this is some things I do know. I like to try to say things that I do know. I do know that Jesus didn't lie here. And that Jesus said no matter what he thought, no matter how he thought he had Jesus' kingdom figured out, Jesus said the promise is this, I say to you today you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that cool? By the way, this guy, if you put the other stories together, it's, it's, it's this guy who was still alive after Jesus died. It's this guy along with the other guy that has his legs shattered and broken so that he'll die on a cross. Now think about that with me. Yet Jesus' promise is still sure, right? Amen? His promise is still true, right? So that means even though he's hanging on a cross in agony longer than Jesus, and even though this man has his legs broken heinously by Roman centurions, the promise is still the promise. This man would see Jesus that day in paradise. How cool is that? Again, that's what I do know. His suffering, even the suffering that he deserved, you hear me? Even suffering that he deserved would not end in vain because his hope, his trust, his help was in King Jesus. That blows my mind. Suffering that he deserved would still not end in vain because his trust, his hope, his help, his fear was in King Jesus. And again, when we receive, when we accept the forgiveness of the king, there is no sin, even sin worthy of crucifixion, that can keep us from paradise. That's the story of this text. One more time. When we receive, when we accept, when we embrace in faith the forgiveness of our king, there is no sin. You hear me? No sin. Even sin worthy of crucifixion, there is no sin that can keep us from paradise. That's a big one for me, and I pray it is for you too. We're going to let the kids come on back in here. I hear them stirring. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about that paradise as we draw to a close. But while they're stirring, we'll be singing. And I love how a lot of the songs we sing for our kids... uh, kind of help along the lesson today too. I think Lamentations is the first one up, up there. Yeah. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in Him. Steadfast love that never ceases. David prayed this after his sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me, and cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Amen. Come, let us sing with joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In His hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, He made it. And his hands, they form the dry land. Very good. 
Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, and the sheep of His hand. Very good, very good. And so, I've heard a lot uh, spoken of paradise uh, in my life and in my ministry, and uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are connected to this story that you're probably anxious, maybe anxious for me to talk about. That Let me put it this way, that have been connected to this story and that have been argued over. And you probably know me by now that I don't, I don't try to go to places that I don't think the Scripture is pointing, pointing us to. Um, we can talk more about that later if you'd like. But when Jesus says paradise, I think there's something really cool that we can think about that is connected to the Scripture. And that's where I'd like to lead us for just a moment as we extend an invitation. Okay, that word, um, I've given that word a lot of thought. That word's been discussed a lot in my circles. Um, My best shot is that Jesus has in mind this beautiful place that is comfortable. And that he has in mind this beautiful, comfortable place where souls go to wait for the resurrection. Okay, there's a lot to that. There's a lot I could say about that. There's a lot we could study about that. But I think that's what Jesus has in mind, this place called paradise. I think that that's what he had in mind when he referred to Abraham's bosom back in Luke 16. Again, you might remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man goes to a place that is not comfortable. But Lazarus goes to a place of comfort, to a place of Abraham's bosom. And again, resurrection is a big part of our, of our faith. You know that, right? Yeah, it's a big part of it. And so um, sometimes, sometimes we, 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 we say things quickly um, in, in ways that show that we don't have resurrection on our mind. We should have resurrection on our mind. That's a big part of our faith. So anyway, I think Jesus is referring to this place, this comfortable place of waiting while souls wait for the resurrection. That word paradise, you find it in Scripture quite a bit, actually. Um, I could tell you a little bit about where it comes from. I won't. But oftentimes when you see that word paradise, it refers to like a beautiful garden or a park or even a forest. I didn't take this picture. This is in the gardens of the Biltmore. You ever been there? I went there once and the house was cool, especially that pool indoor. That was neat. But that garden was breathtaking. And I, I still had an old dumb phone back then. I was taking pictures with my dumb phone of lilies and tulips. and Oh, it was cool. And so anyway, that's kind of what I had in mind. Um, King Artaxerxes had a, had a paradise of trees. Those trees were harvested and used to rebuild the temple around Jerusalem. That's cool. Um, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, who we think is Solomon, he planted paradise gardens. He thought that they would give him what he wanted in life. All these beautiful gardens and forests and irrigated fruit trees. And oh man, he planted so many of them. Uh, But the paradise that, that, that I think is best for us to consider, or the garden I think best for us to consider, is probably that original garden. That original paradise. That garden of Eden. Again, all these words you can connect in Scripture when you study. And that's a really good one. And so Genesis 2, verse 8, you know this. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. He placed there the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord caused every tree that is pleasing in the sight and good for food. The tree of life and was in the midst of the garden. Also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now think about this with me. I'm, we're, we're, the, the, the invitation is extended. Be thinking about responding, if you will, please. Embracing this forgiveness, responding to it in faith, repenting, being baptized. But think about this. I've often thought that the worst sin in that garden was when Adam and Eve ate that fruit. But I'm going to think about that a little differently now too. Because because do you remember with me when God confronted Adam, what he did? Remember what Adam did? 
Adam said, oh, it's a woman who, who, by the way, you made for me, who, 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 who took the fruit and ate it, and then I ate it. And so then God then confronts Eve. And you remember what Eve did? Eve, Eve said, oh, well, it was the snake who, 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 who deceived me, and then I ate it. I've been thinking about that, and I can't help but connect it back to the cross of Jesus here this week. That first criminal on the cross, he was guilty, right? That's what the text teaches us. But what was his response to his sin? Arrogance, obstinance. You do this. Like That second criminal on the cross, what was his response to his sin? Guilty. I'm up here and I deserve to be here. Oh, oh Lord, please, by the way, just, just remember me. Help me. Keep me close to you might be the word picture there for us. And what's Jesus' promise? When we respond to our sin with, I'm guilty. Help me. Remember me. Don't separate me from you. What's Jesus' response? Paradise. You see that? A garden. I don't know if it would have been any different if Adam and Eve had said, Guilty. I did it. It was me. I don't know if it would have been Dilsey. Might have saved us a lot of trouble, to be honest with you, right? I don't know. But again, what I do know is that the call is for us to respond guilty. Guilty. Please, I need you. I need that forgiveness that you extend. Please, I need it. And that's the call for us all, and especially you today. We'll sing for your encouragement. Thank you, guys. Love you guys. And can it be that I should gain an interest in